Holiness is this idea, just to recap, is this idea of uh, the fact that we belong to God. Holiness is this idea that we just, we just, ultimately we belong to God. There's a lot of misconstrued ideas, but I want that to be the very foundational, in a nutshell, thing. Is that holiness is this idea that we belong to God. God says, I am, be holy for I am holy. God says, be holy for I am holy. And if that were humanly possible, we would say that to be holy is to live according to God's moral standard 100% of the time. That's what we would say. That is the actual being set apart from the world, being consecrated to the Lord, being separated to God, is the idea of holiness. It is belonging to the Lord. But it isn't humanly possible to be 100% of the time morally right according to God's law, is it? It's not possible. Because I've already messed up, haven't you? Yeah, so I'm already like at 99%, right? You believe that. Um, <laughs> another dumb joke. That's okay. You don't have to laugh. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's this idea that, that, that we would be perfect, morally right, morally true. And a very high percentage of us, quite possibly 100% of us, would have to say that there are things that we do, think, or say that we don't want to give up. Would you agree? You don't have to raise your hand, but would you, would you just quietly agree with me by shaking your head up and down, yes or no? Or side to side. You, don't really, you can't say no doing this. I know that. All right, that that probably I would I would guess one hundred percent of us would have to say that there are things that we do, think or say that we don't want to give up, that we know are wrong. And so, in thinking about all this, there's this instinct, there's this drive, there's this idea that pushes us away from even wanting to be holy. We call that the flesh or, or the sinful nature. Um, when I talk about the flesh, I'm not just talking about the fact that we're in bodies and we're not in our resurrected bodies yet. It, it, the flesh is this idea of, of an evil nature, a sinful nature, and that everybody's got it. The Bible says that, you're never, that, if, that if you've never sinned, you're deceiving yourself and the truth or God's spirit is not in you. That comes from 1 John 1, 1.8. And so, so for most of us, we can look at ourselves and say, yes, there are times that I choose to sin, and in those moments, I genuinely want this. I genuinely want to eat the whole package of Oreos. I genuinely want to lie. I genuinely want to steal. I genuinely want to gossip. I genuinely want to walk into an affair. I genuinely want to be drunk right? I genuinely want to be angry or I want to be addicted. There are times and there are people that are caught up in these sins in life that they actually enjoy them. It's hard to realize for a lot of us, especially those of you that grew up in church, because that's not the right answer, right? Like if I ask you, do you want to sin? Everybody in here would be like, no, right? <laughs> We're in church, Right? And so that's the right answer. But if we're honest with ourselves and we evaluate ourselves based upon the things that have even happened this week, maybe even this morning, there are times that we would have to say, yeah, I wanted to do that. I walked right into that willingly. So we have to diagnose the problem before it can be fixed, right? Well, how many of you have been to a doctor and they've told you you've had something you didn't have and they started treating you for that symptom and it turned out to be not even the right thing. And in, in some instances, that might have made you even more ill, right? We have to know what the problem is before we can actually begin to fix it. Holiness is this idea of belonging to the Lord, making every effort to live according to His moral standard as a response to the life-saving sacrifice that He made available to us. Anyone who calls themselves a Christian implies not a lifestyle or culture, but listen to me, an allegiance to Jesus. They're not living according to a culture or a lifestyle. We're not just adopting a worldview here. We are living in allegiance to Jesus. Because what our salvation involves is a confession that Jesus is Lord over my life. That means that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 So by taking the name Christian, you're saying, I've made a commitment to live according to the example of Christ. The vision is 
That's why we say this. I've made a commitment to live according to Jesus, to the vision of Christ, and I will belong to the Lord, and I will live under the power of the Holy Spirit. It also means that you're inviting an entire community to not only encourage you and show you grace, but also to correct you and to rebuke you in love. That's what that means. Kind of stinks, doesn't it? Let's be honest. You get called out and that hurts. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but that's, that hurts. So, if you're, so the weight of the Christian life is this, is that you can't walk in holiness and make peace with your flesh. All right. I need you to understand that. You can't walk in holiness and also make peace with your flesh, the sinful nature. If you're going to pursue holiness, you can't be okay with sin. If you're going to pursue holiness, you can't be okay with sin. The appropriate response to sin is guilt and shame. It's a dirty feeling. And not necessarily crushing or overbearing, not total depression, not any kind of that, but there is a necessary feeling of guilt and shame. Enough to set kind of a course correction in our lives. There should be this feeling of dirtiness because we know that we've offended our God, the one who we've claimed to be allegiant to. So there shouldn't be any kind of peace within evil. In fact, you may have heard this before, but there's a saying, kill sin or it'll kill you. You ever heard that before? I like it. Kill sin or always be killing sin or it will always be killing you. Romans 8.13 says, For I, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Kill sin or it will kill you. It's basically the truth of that verse is communicating. So the question that we're going to try and answer today is how do we do that? How do we actually put sin to death? How do we kill it? And how do we live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh or our sin nature? And so killing something doesn't happen defensively, right? <laughs> you don't like trip it and it, you know, dies, right? Are you with me? It's an offensive thing, isn't it? When you go to kill a fly, you pick up a fly swatter and you charge it, right? You don't just sit around and let it land on you and it just dies, right? That's not the idea, all right? And so in battle, when you want to win a war, you don't just stand back and laugh at them and wait for them to come at you unless you're a hulk, right? No, what, what do armies do? They charge. They go on the offense to, to, to defeat something, to kill sin, to do anything. It is an offensive thing. But many times, we stand on defense, a lot of times we take a defensive mode rather than an offensive mode. So if you look at Ephesians 6, there's a section of Scripture that talks about the armor of God. Now, it's not necessarily a literal armor all right, that you can craft and you can make, but it is a spiritual armor that defends your soul from evil. All right? And so most of it's defensive. It, it talks about a belt. It talks about a breastplate, a shield, um, a helmet, and more. Mostly protective, mostly defensive. But there's one purely offensive weapon, and we find that in verse 17. It says, and take, up, and take the helmet of salvation and the what? Sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Have you ever tried to wield a sword before? A real sword. Like, it is heavy. I like to play swords with cardboard tubes around Christmas time, right? That's a lot of fun, all right? But a cardboard tube is a lot different than a real sword, isn't it? I don't have any problem swinging a cardboard tube and hitting Keith over the head with that. That ain't a real problem, right? Because I know he ain't going to be hurt, and I'm, just, and, and, and I'm not going to hurt myself, right? <laughs> but if I pick up a real sword, do I know what I'm doing with it? No, I've never been trained in sword handling. I ain't got a clue. But you watch, like, sh TV shows, like... And, and, and these martial arts people, and you're like, I can do that. And one too many of, of men have picked up nunchucks and hurt themselves <laughs> trying to do that, right? Because we don't know how to wield the weapon, right? We don't know how to use the weapon effectively. I've got a couple of like play swords. They're, they're sharp. They're not like 
battle things. They're just more decorative pieces. I kind of like weapony things, and I, I don't know how to use them. Um, but uh, but I, I have one at home, and like I just look at it because I'm too afraid to pick it up and like you know be like because <laughs> I've cut myself a few times with with just knives and jackknives, you know, just trimming up cardboard and such, right? So there's a problem. And you think that if, like, like drunken J- Captain Jack Sparrow from the Pirates of the Caribbean, if he can sword fight, so can I. <laughs> so, so you look at this, and in order for the sword to be effective, you can't just hold it. What do you got to do with it? You have to wield it. You got to use it. You have to be able to, and you have to be unafraid to use it. There's a certain fear when you're swinging a sword around. And, and if you know what you're doing, there's a fearful confidence in it, isn't there? There's a fearful confidence in using it as a weapon. You can wield it if necessary, but you're not going to hang on to it all the time. So in putting sin to death and living according to the Spirit so that we may have life, happens by wielding the sword of the Spirit or the Word of God. Now think about this for a second. A sword is incredibly powerful if it's used right, isn't it? If it's not used right, though, it's incredibly dangerous. It can't do much if it's left on the wall. It can't do much if it's left in its sheath. It can't do much if it's left on the ground. And likewise, you and I, we have mobility and intelligence. We can think at an incredibly fast pace, can't we? We can react to things quickly. We can, we can judge quickly and make movements quickly. But our limbs will never be as effective as a sword. And so it's when two, the two are working in unison together that a man becomes a soldier. Does that make sense? The sword all by itself is not going to have mobility. It's not going to have an ability of its own. Well, the man on its own is going to be dangerous. When a man picks up a sword, then he can be a soldier, right? An effective soldier, let me put it that way. I think being a soldier is an attitude. (laughs) When we work in unison with the Word of God, then we become dangerously offensive. We become dangerously offensive. But that requires trust. Galatians 3.5 says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by works of the law or by hearing of faith? Paul's asking a question here. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you, so does God who supplies the Holy Spirit to us, and God who works miracles among us, do so by works of the law or, or by things that we do, or by hearing with faith, or by trusting in the Lord and trusting in His promises? Does God give you the Spirit based on your performance and the things that you've done? What's the answer to that? No. Every other religion in the world, that's what they practice, is that you achieve by doing. But that's not Christianity. God, the God we worship, gives us the Spirit and works miracles among us by the hearing with faith. Faith is trust in what God has promised us. I can believe all I want to that you guys are going to give me a million dollars at the end of service today. All right? I can believe it all I want. But that doesn't mean that, I, that it's true, right? However, if one of you came up to me and said, hey, at the end of service today, I'm going to write you a check for a million dollars, that changes the game, doesn't it? You told me you were going to give me a million dollars. I can have faith that you're going to give me a million dollars because you've told me, you've given me your word. Does that make sense? So instead of me just wishful thinking, standing at the door, being like, have a great day. Where's your check? Have a great day. Where's your check? Right? Instead of that attitude and just believing that, I can have faith if you promise that to me. Now, I don't expect that, obviously. Would be nice. You know, somebody at the gas station won $1.1 million here not too long ago, right? Yeah. It's not worth it. Um, So here's the battle in this between belief and faith. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to the God. 
And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this is, this is a promise that, that God has given to us in His Word. So when I go to bed at night, and I'm worried about tomorrow, but I choose to continue the conversation in my mind, I continue to worry, and I refuse to walk into prayer, what I'm doing in this instance is I am rejecting God's promise. And I am demonstrating a lack of trust. I am demonstrating a lack of faith in Him. If I don't trust the promises that God has given me, then I flat out just don't have faith. That's just the bottom line. You can make whatever religion up you want to, but if you do not trust the promises that God has given to you, you don't have any basis for faith. All you have is belief. And that is about as useless as me telling you today that the sky is out there green right now. I should probably go check it just to make sure nothing weird's happening. But you get what I mean, right? That's, about as you, uh, uh, that's how useful that is. So if I don't trust God, if I don't trust what His Word says, then I am not hearing with faith, and that is in the way which God supplies His Spirit to us. Now look at me with, uh, look at me, look at, look with me at, sorry, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. It says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You see, God chose you to be saved through sanctification. That's the key point I want to bring out of this verse. That's the process by which we're putting sin to death, is salvation. Uh, being saved, that's the idea. And the process of sanctification is the continual growing in the Lord, is the continual submission to the Lord after we've made a commitment, after we've been baptized into Christ, after we've been justified and adopted into His family. Then after that begins this process, what we call sanctification. And it's an ongoing, brooding out of sin, becoming a, a holier person. Putting the deeds of the body to death. And so if you walk obediently through sanctification the rest of your days of your life, God says He promises salvation. And sanctification happens when two things combine. So salvation, we see in this verse, to, God shows you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And so sanctification happens when these two things combine, the Spirit and belief in the truth, or we would call that faith. And so here's how you put sin to death. You wield the sword of the Spirit. You grab hold of God's Word, God's truth, and you put it in your mind. You let it bake there. You let it affect the way that you think. You meditate on it. You memorize it, and you become satisfied with it. And that's key, that you become satisfied with it. Because there's nothing you can do to add God's truth to make it sweeter, more enjoyable, or more complete. You can add your intentions to it, but it won't work. It won't change anything about God's Word. You can't even add your motives to it. It ain't going to do anything. God's Word, listen, God's Word simply is. It simply is. And you can't take any words away from it. You can't rip out pages in your Bible that you don't like. You can't take a sharpie and black out verses that you don't really want to live by. And you can't add to it. You can't put in other practices that don't exist in the Scripture because this is wrong. God's Word simply is. And that's it. And we decide whether or not we will stand upon it or stand on our own logic. And so we go back to our earlier example about worry and anxiousness. If you have faith and you're satisfied with God's promises, then what you'll do is follow through by praying and petitioning God. And the result, by faith and the work of the Spirit, is that you will have peace that just doesn't make sense. It will be beyond understanding. And so what you've just done, because you've had faith and the Spirit is at work within you, you've now slain the sin. Now you've put it to death. So you're not going to go on worrying, which the Bible teaches us not to. 
You're not going to go on being concerned. And you've slain the sin. You are no longer mastered by the sin. You are now belonging to God, which means that you are becoming a holier man or woman. You're becoming a man or woman of God. So in order to put the sin to death, you wield the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, in faith, trusting it to be sufficient and the superior guide to your life. But we are all intimately aware that this is not a natural thing, is it? It's not natural to want to slay the sin, right? We just talked about it a little earlier. Our will is that we would sin. It, we've heard it many times. If, if, if uh, sin were like a root canal, you wouldn't do it, right? Yeah. If sin caused you to bleed, you probably wouldn't do it. If sin caused pain in your life, you probably wouldn't walk into it so willingly. There is an uh, instant gratification usually wrapped up with sin. It's not natural. All of us live in this world, which means that without a doubt, without a doubt, there are some ways that you act, ways that you think, ways that you speak that are not in line with God's Word. We've picked up habits that offend our God. And there's a good chance that for some, we don't even realize it. And this is why putting sin to death isn't a process that we should be dominating or controlling. It's actually a process that we're, act, we're, we're more responsive to. This is why the, psalm write, the psalmist writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. What he's asking God to do is that God would convict him. If there is any sin in his life, anything present in his life that is evil. He wants God to declare him guilty if he is in fact guilty, but he just can't see it for himself. How many of you have ever had someone point something out in your life that you're like, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that? Yeah? Definitely. Definitely. I didn't realize I was doing that. I'm glad that you let me know about that. Sometimes it's painful, sometimes it hurts, but it's necessary to kind of move forward, right? You can become a better person. Because of that idea. And so that's an attitude that we should seek to adopt, is one that, search me out, oh God. If there's, if there's an attitude in my life that I, I need to get rid of, if, there's a, if there is a habit in my life that I'm not aware is, 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 is offending you, God, search me out. Use your spirit to tell me these things. Convict me of this. It's something we should be adopting. That attitude is something we should be adopting. Conviction is a humbling thing, though. Isn't it? Oh, it stinks when that little thing, especially like, like some of you have come up to me after, after church and been like, you were talking about me all day today. I'm like, I don't have cameras installed in your home, so I'm not really sure what you're talking about. But what has happened there is the Spirit has convicted you. He's called you out. Sometimes people walk up to me and they're angry at me because of what I've said. Sometimes it's because I've said something wrong which they are calling me out and convicting me, which is a good thing. But other times, they've been convicted and they don't like it. It's painful. It's a humbling thing, but it's a painful thing because it attacks your ego, it attacks your confidence. Um, and that is honestly a great thing, but, but we don't like it usually. I want to let you know that pain isn't a bad thing. Can I tell you something today? Pain isn't a bad thing. Our culture worships moving ourselves away from pain and making things as easy as possible. Like, it is painful for some people to wait in line at a fast food restaurant, right? If the food takes two minutes longer than what they're used to, they're screaming at the person behind the counter. Pain is not a bad thing, is it? We don't like it. We don't like to be inconvenienced. We don't like it when the person in front of us on the road is going 45 and a 55, right? We're being inconvenienced. I'm as guilty of that as anyone in here, so don't. I'm just using a self-example there. It's not a bad thing. Because it's through pain that we change, isn't it? It's through pain that we change. Think about it. When you get your first place, when you get your first apartment, home, uh, rental home, whatever it is, you you don't really need that much space, especially if you're on your own, right? You need a bedroom, you need a kitchen, you need a living room, maybe, you know, 
It's not going to be very big. But that space gets a little bit smaller after you get married, right? The space actually didn't change. You just got another person living there. But the pain of moving outweighs the pain of sticking around, right? Who wants to pack up their bed? That just stinks moving to bed and couches and all that wonderful stuff, right? Don't want to do that. And so nothing changes. But when kids come along, you're starting to step on Legos every single day. The pain of staying in that small space instantly becomes greater than the pain of moving, right? And so what do we do? We pack up our boxes, we move our bed, we move our couches, we, we, we just suck it up for the time, right? And we get it done so we can enjoy life. Pain produces change. And it's the same thing for us. Until our sin becomes painful through conviction, we're probably not going to change. The actual, sin, the actual sinful acts are things that we enjoy. If sin hurt, we wouldn't do it. But what we must change is our heart towards sin. All right? As our heart for the Lord increases, the sinful nature hurts more and more. We become more and more convicted. And conviction is by nature a painful process. This is why John 14, 21 uh, reads, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. But again, we see here that this begins with the Word of God. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Whoever has my Word and lives according to it, it is he who loves me. If this is a truth, then the opposite is also true. Whoever has my commandments and does not keep them, he does not love me. And there was conviction. Because if you know you are not doing something that the Lord has commanded you to do, then what this is saying is that you truly do not love the Lord. And as a man standing before you, I stand convicted by this. Because there are certain things in my life that still do not belong to the Lord. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about how to wield the sword in a practical way. How do we use the Word of God? Like, like how do we actually put it into practice so that we can go ahead, wield the sword effectively, and begin to root out all of that sinful nature in our lives? If putting sin to death and a desire to, to, to put sin to death is dependent upon the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, then our game plan must involve the Scriptures, Right? Like we can't, we can't just leave. We just can't, we can't walk around and live in our Christian life with our Word of God over there, right? Be like, how's it going? You love Jesus? Yeah, you. Me too. Awesome. Let's sing together. Yeah, let's do that and let's grow together, right? What good is a Bible study if all you do is hang drywall together, right? <laughs> that actually happened last night. Just letting you know. <laughs> I'm totally ragging on Ken a little bit, but he's bigger than me, so I'm going to stop. Um, no, it was ministry. Absolutely, it was ministry. Uh, I'm super grateful. What's that? I'm just ragging on you a little bit. But it's true. Like, what good is it if we just leave it behind? Right? Now, here's the thing. It's Proverbs 27, 17. says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I'm covering my butt now. Um, as you spend time together with one another, things, things sharpen, we sharpen each other, Right? The Word of God is in me and it is in you. We can, we can begin to discuss those things. We begin to, to, to work on those things. Right? As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So, how do we take hold of the Scriptures? A lot of people think that carrying around a Bible makes them spiritual. <laughs> a lot of people think posting a Scripture on Facebook makes them spiritual. People think that having the Ten Commandments posted in their home makes them spiritual. Now, if you have that, that's not wrong. I'm glad that you honor the Scriptures like that, and I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily level that judgment against you. But I, I mean, I've had people in my lifetime tell me how many Bibles they own and how many different versions that they own, 
and basically expect me to think that they're a scholar in the Scriptures when they don't read it. And how many times have I, myself, I'll use myself as an example, been guilty of leaving my Bible on the shelf and not opening it up every single day of my life? Not being transformed by the content, by the truth that is in it. And so that works just about as good. Like carrying around a Bible, putting Scripture on a wall, doing all these things, this works just about as good as sleeping on a textbook before an exam to get it into your mind, right? How many of us have tried that trick before? I need sleep, but I need to study. I need to know this information. So I'm going to put it under my pillow, and we're just going to hope that it like absorbs into my brain, right? <laughs> somehow, somehow we think that when we do this with our Bible, it's going to like go in through our gut. And you know what I mean? That's kind of the idea that it's kind of silly that, to think about it that way. No, we've got we to gotta crack it open. We've got to hear it proclaimed. We've got to be taught. We need to teach it. Like, you retain so much more information when you teach than when you just listen. It's amazing. And so here's how the psalmist describes taking hold of the Word. He says, I have stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does the idea of stored bring to mind? Reserve. Yeah, that's a good word. You take it, what I think of is, is if you're talking about a storehouse and farming, you go out in the field, you pick it, and you take it to the storehouse, and you move it from one location to the other. When I look at this, it's moving the Word of God from the pages, from ink and paper, into words in our minds that become living and active. And so how do you store something up in your heart? You make it a part of you. You memorize it. You put it in your mind. The goal of Bible memorization is not academic. God is not going to quiz you at the pearly gates. Quick, what is John 3.16? Right? But he's not going to do that. It's not going to happen. Why would we want to memorize John 3.16? It's so that we can understand and take hold of the promise that God has said. Uh, say it again. Not fast. That was still kind of fast. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is a promise that you can take hold of so that when you are feeling down and out, you can go, I can, and you're feeling dirty before God, you can be reminded of your belief in Him. You can be reminded of the commitment that you've made to Him, and He will tell you that whoever believes in Me, that because you believe in Me, I will give you eternal life. And that can inspire confidence inside of you. Confidence in the Word of God. Not based upon your shoulders, not based upon your strength, but based upon God's strength and His ability to redeem you. That's what that Scripture is about. That's why memorizing the Scriptures is so important. The purpose of memorizing it is application. It doesn't do any good if you're like, well, the Bible says not to worry, but I'm not really sure where it says that. But instead, if you start to worry and the words come to mind, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So the moment you begin to worry, the moment that you become anxious, you submit your mind to the Lord. And I'm not saying that's going to cause a cure in your mind if you struggle with anxiety. I'm not going to tell you that it's going to get rid of the worry. I'm not going to tell you that it's instantly going to disappear. But I will tell you that God has promised this and that if we would obey it, there is eventually going to come a peace that will surpass all understanding. God wrote it. He put it in His Word and I believe it. I have faith that He will deliver because He said it. And so how powerful is that? How comforting is that to know that when we store these things up in our minds, they become active. They bring correction. They bring hope. They bring conviction. They bring holiness. So with that truth in your mind, the Spirit will convict you of worrying and move you into a dependence upon the Lord. This is exactly how we develop conviction. Jerry Bridges, the author of Pursuit of Holiness, says, it's by bringing the word to bear on specific situations that arise in our lives and determining God's will that in that situation from the world. So, 
a lot of things uh, are already addressed in the Scriptures. I'm going to rapid fire these. They're going to come up on the screen so you can see them, but I'm going to go quickly. Um, take honesty, for instance. Ephesians 4.25, it says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So, boom, we're not to lie. Uh, uh, not to deceive other people. The, the, take the way that we speak, the words that come out of our mouth, the tone that comes out of our mouth. Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that might give grace to those who hear. So this would also cover lying because it would destroy trust, but this would also cover some levels of sarcasm that are degrading. This would cover certain jokes that would uh, go to disrupt holiness in other people's lives. This would go for a lot of things, corrupting talk. Let's take lust. 1 Corinthians 6.18 Flee from sexual immorality. Pretty, pretty direct, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm pretty sure we all know what sexual immorality is. Drunkenness. Ephesians 5.18 Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Debauchery is just basically uh, personal passions of the flesh, just kind of engaging these things, letting yourself go to those. Um, but be filled with the Spirit. Pride. Proverbs 16.5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. That's a strong word. Everyone who is arrogant in their heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So the Bible addresses specific things. And I want to tell you, it's important. I picked these certain verses because there wasn't a whole lot of implications around it either. But there are ways that you can pick a single scripture out of, out of context and use that as a weapon that isn't the way it was intended to be used. You can wield the sword dangerously in that manner. You can use it to kill rather than build up other people. So, what about the things that aren't addressed specifically in Scripture? How do we know what God would have us do in these situations? Well, um, the pursuit of holiness had a great uh, four-question thing directly from Scripture, and I want to go over this quickly with you. How do we know what God would have us do in situations that aren't directly addressed in Scripture? We're going to ask some questions. 1 Corinthians 6.12 It says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. So, the question that we would ask is, is what you're considering helpful physically, spiritually, and mentally? That would be the question we would ask from this. Not all things are helpful for us. 1 Corinthians 6.12, the second half of this says, All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. So the question we would ask from this is, is, is what I'm considering uh, going to bring me under its power? Am I going to be mastered by this? 1 Corinthians 8.13 then says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. And so when you look at this, the, the, the context of what he's talking about in here, um, he's, he's asking basically, he's directing that the eating this meat might actually harm other people and in their faith and certain convictions that they've developed in life. And so the question is, is I'm, am I hurting others in what I'm going to be doing? Both physically, spiritually, and mentally. And finally, the fourth question in 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so the capstone question is, does what you're about to do, think or say, glorify your God? And so these, these four questions are very powerful in producing conviction or freeing you to enjoy something without worry. Uh, think about it from the perspective of the music that you listen to and ask these questions. Does this song help me physically, spiritually, and mentally? Is it somehow benefiting me in all three areas? Is it helping me focus? Is it bringing me into worship? Is it relaxing me? Am I working out to it? And it's just like kind of pumping me up, right? We all have those guilty pleasure songs, you know. Guys, Taylor Swift comes on the radio and you find your head bopping up and down. I know you do, all right? Come on. Um, it's all good. It's happened to me once or twice. I'll be, I'll be the first to admit that. All right? Um, does this song bring me under its power? So the idea is, is that could I turn it off in the middle of it? Could I just hit the radio and turn off this music if I wanted to, if I needed to? Would I be able to do that? Or would I be like, ah, I don't want to turn it I love this song so much. Right? <laughs> Or the other question, 
Do I swear because I listen to this song? Does this song cause me to act differently? And that would be a form of bringing it under, bringing you under its power. The third question, does it hurt others? Does this song degrade other people? Is it offensive to the people that I'm with? Does it glorify God? That's the fourth question. Does listening to this song or this music glorify God? And there goes half of my iTunes library out the window right there. Right? If we're honest with ourselves. Isn't it pretty clear that how you answer these questions determine whether or not you should be participating in something? Doesn't that make it like just vibrantly clear? Like you can take any situation and submit it to those four questions and generally you're going to come out with an answer on the other side. I'm not going to say every situation. But darn near all of them. And so if you use Scripture to develop these convictions about, about what you should and you should not do, then you are well on your way to putting sin to death and living a life that belongs to the Lord. Now there's one last thing about convictions that I, need, I, I feel I need to cover, and I'll, I'll go quickly through this because I'm, I'm running over already, and I apologize for that. But There's a difference in being convicted and having a conviction, though they are related, all right? You know that there's a difference in being convicted and having a conviction? Okay? If you are convicted about doing something and you choose not to do it as a, as a result, you have now created a belief that you should not do it based upon that conviction. Right? So if I am convicted that I will not listen to... I'm just going to throw this out here. I, this, is not, this is hypothetical. I am convicted that rap music is of the devil. Okay? <laughs> just, just irritated some of you guys in here. Um, okay, and other you are like, "Amen, yeah, hallelujah." All right, so, <laughs> so if I am if I am convicted that rap music is of the devil, and I have my reasons for that, and I hopefully will base those reasons based off of scripture, then my conviction is that I will no longer listen to rap music. Right? I have that conviction. I have been convicted, a verb, and now I have a conviction, a noun, which is a belief that I will live by. Okay? So, it's a firmly held belief or, or opinion is what it is. So what that means is that your convictions and my convictions can differ. Where there are gray areas in Scripture, you can have convictions that are different from my convictions. That is allowed in this wonderful, awesome thing that we call Christianity. And so certain practices or ideas that are a part of your faith may not necessarily be a part of mine and vice versa. For instance, take alcohol consumption. All right, This has been a hot topic throughout many years. It's, is it okay or is it not okay? All right, The Bible says do not become drunk, but what about a drink? And so for some, they will argue, well, the Bible actually says to have some wine for the stomach. It's a good thing. But then other people will be like, their wine is nothing like our wine today. And so you have this argument. And you have some different sides on this whole thing. It didn't say anything about tequila, all right? <laughs> I'm not sure that's nervous laughter or... Like, if we started putting tequila in the, in the communion cups, or you guys would be all like, I'll come to church next week. I don't know. I'm not really sure what's going on with that one. <laughs> but <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> Steering team just went down to twice a month meetings. We're going back to once a week. They're going to yell at me for that one. Um, all right. So for some, they're going to test out new drinks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> for some, they can walk through and they say, yes, it helps me. No, it doesn't bring me under its power. No, it doesn't hurt anyone else. And yes, I think that there is a way that I can use alcohol to glorify God. There are some people that are going to come to that conclusion based upon their knowledge of the Scriptures and what they do. They know that to violate the, the command that to, become, to, to not become drunk that is, you, your convictions don't outweigh what God's Word says. I'm going to tell you that flat out right now, all right? God's Word says it, that's the way we live it. Your convictions are the gray areas that are left out of Scripture, okay? And so for others, they're going to, their answers are going to look a lot different, and it's going to be, no, I can't, there's, my, there's our gremlins, I can't 
I can't consume alcohol. It is against what I believe the Bible teaches. And so automatically a disagreement can happen, and in potential, there will be sin. Because disunity is not something that God wants in the body. And so here's how God wants us to handle our convictions. And this is going to solve a lot of issues in the areas where God has not commanded it. And so I want to read quickly Romans uh, chapter 14, the beginning of it, verse, verses 1 through 4. It says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. All right? What is a conviction? It's a firmly held belief or opinion. So not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And so what he is addressing here is that the Apostle Paul is ultimately not telling us, or he is telling us, not to pass judgment on those whose convictions are different from ours. All right? So there are many denominations of Christianity, right? We think some are weird, right? Because it's not the way we do it. Would you agree with that? You're all right. So you would walk into some other church and be like, you guys are kind of weird, but go for it. If you believe this is the way God has asked you to worship and there's nothing in Scripture that is clearly violated, then more power to you, right? That's the way we got to look at it. If you think one thing and I think another and we are both reasonable in coming to our conclusions and no Scripture explicitly says one way or the other, then we're free to hold those convictions. Let's keep going. Verses 5 through 8. It says, One person esteems one day as better than another. This is relating to the Sabbath day and the Ten Commandments. God would talk about keeping the Sabbath holy. So one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems that all days are alike. Each one should full, be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord, and the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to the Lord. So whether we, we live or we die, we are the Lord's. So the second thing that the Scripture is telling us about our convictions is that, whether, uh, is that whatever they are, they must be in honor of the Lord and out of obedience to Him. At no time can the truth of God's word be overturned by our convictions. I just want to put that before you. Romans 14, 23 now, finally. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Did you catch that? Whatever, whatever happens that is not in faith, it's sin. So if you're not sure of your conviction, then you shouldn't hold it. You need to become convict, convinced of your conviction. If you have convictions about something, then it must be universally true and sound in and, and, and godly logic. Because if you have a conviction and you go against that conviction, then it would be declared sinful. All right? And so it's important for us. Listen, it's important for us to know the Word of God. It's important for us to be putting it in our minds, grabbing hold of the God's Word, memorizing it so that the Spirit can use it in producing convictions that will slay sin in a partnership between the power of God and our obedience to Him. What I have talked about today in putting sin in your mind and coming to the conclusion of convictions is developing a theology. Developing a belief system in which you apply God's Word and that you understand it. And I know the word theology sounds scary and for academics and, and scholars, but it's not. What we do every single week, what I talk about every single week, is basically built out of a theology. And we should be studying it and we should be working towards that. Yeah, I know, it's buzzing a lot. It's out, of the, it's out of the English Standard Version. There's nowhere near that. Well, I'll check it later. All right, so um, it's important for us to know the Word of God. It's important for us to be putting it in our minds, grabbing hold of it, memorizing it so the Spirit can use it and producing convictions that will slay the sin in partnership between the power of God and our obedience to Him. And then in the areas that haven't been colored in yet, we get to embrace diversity in our thinking. And that's why it's so beautiful about our faith. 
but it's also super dangerous. I want you to understand that this is a super dangerous thing. It is a sword. It is a sword. And if you use it wrong, it's, 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 it's deadly. That's why Bob is calling me out, because if I'm using it wrong, it's deadly, isn't it? Absolutely. It's important that we do these things. And so if you can allow me to have convictions, and I can't, I can't allow you to have yours, then we're looking at disunity, and that's not what Jesus wanted. He prayed for unity in John chapter 17. We get to have diversity in our thinking as long as we're thinking critically and carefully with respect to and a desire to obey God's law. This is what produces holiness in us, is being students of God's Word. And this is why it's imperative to be reading and studying your Bible. It's the key to putting sin to death and living a holy life.